It's fall, which means my summer garden has come to a close. But here in Sacramento, California, zone 9B, right now is a great time to start all of my cool season or even cold season vegetables, my fall and my winter crops. And actually, I'm about a month behind when I normally plant my fall and winter garden. Today, as I film this, it's October 15th, and it's 93 degrees right now. So aside from the shorter days, it really does not feel like fall. And for that reason, I'm not too concerned about getting a late start on my fall garden. But that's also not the reason that I'm starting late this year. Um, although the weather is kind of one of the reasons. So if you follow me on Instagram, you might know, but if you don't, um, my regular job is not maintaining an urban farm or making instructional gardening videos. I work as a firefighter, a California firefighter for the last 15 years. And if you live anywhere in the country, you probably understand that this year in 2020, we have had a very, very busy fire season. So the last month and a half or so, I've had four days off of work. Um, so it hasn't really given me a lot of time for this garden. And it's, and it's actually sort of brings me to a point that a lot of people ask me about, like with having such a large garden, you know, doesn't it take a lot of time? And it certainly can, but if you set it up the right way, it can be very low maintenance. If you set up your soil properly, your irrigation, everything else, it's fairly low maintenance. And I have a, a whole t bunch of videos on how I set this whole thing up so that I can leave it for a month when I need to for work. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today, I just wanna talk about, um, you know, I wanna give like a general garden tour to show what's going on in the garden right now. The last garden tour I did was in summer, showed you a lot of the stuff that I was growing, showed you a lot of tips on, you know, kind of how I grow stuff, some of my favorite summer vegetables. But today I wanna show you just the general state of the garden right now in fall. But mostly I wanna show you what I do to transition from my summer garden to my fall and winter garden. And it's fairly simple. I've been doing it now for 15 years, um, but I've got a few different stages here. So I'm gonna show you what I got going. I'm gonna show you how I prep my soil, prep my beds, show you some of the things I'm planting, how I plant them. And if you have any questions along the way, ask them. All right, we started the summer garden right here at the bean trellis. Might as well start the fall uh, garden tour and garden prep video right here as well. So in summer, I still had a lot of green beans on this trellis because that's what I'm growing. But as you know, they heat up and the crop finishes off, a lot of these green bean pods start to dry up and look like this. And I talked about this in that video, but basically at this point, all of these are now dry beans. So you know, you're not gonna gr uh, cook up this entire pod like you would a green bean, but they're not just going in the compost either. You can still cook these up just like you would any other dry bean, any black bean, pinto bean, anything like that. Or you can save these and you can replant them because these are just bean seeds now. So you can replant them next spring, which is what I do with a lot of them. So this entire bean trellis, I'll pull everything off of this. I'll save a lot of those pods. I'll cook some, I'll plant some. Moving over to the next rows, this is where I have cucumbers and uh, melons and a little bit of winter squash as well. All of the cucumbers have been pulled from these trellises, but there are a couple of watermelons left. Look at this one. So as I said, I left uh, for about a month and a half. Didn't really have time to get this thing into the right place, so it's grown right into that trellis. Um, it's not quite large enough or ripe enough to harvest yet. It is a small variety, so it's pretty much at its size, but it's not ripe enough to harvest. Pretty soon, I'll get that thing out of there, hopefully before the frost. Um, and then as we come back here, we've got some winter squash. So here is a butternut squash. These things love hanging on trellises like this. Super easy to grow. Um, 
One thing I think that might be difficult for people to wrap their head around with winter squash is they don't grow in winter. They grow in summer, just like summer squash do, but they are going to be uh, basically shelf stable through winter. So I'll harvest these, I'll put them in our basement. You can put them in your garage anywhere cool and dry. They're gonna last a long time. Moving over to the uh, next row here, I had more cucumbers on this one again. I've got some more winter squash here. These ones are actually, these are technically center cut squash. So this is not a butternut squash like the other one was. These are a winter squash variety that's grown by row seven seeds. They're meant to be harvested early and used kind of like zucchini. But this time of year, I leave a few of them on to mature like this and I'll harvest them like winter squash and they're delicious. Tomatillos here. These things, these are done. This plant is completely dried out, done. Everything's been harvested. This thing's just gonna come out of the ground. All finished. Um, the tomatoes, because it's still warm, I'm still getting flowers, still getting fruit, still getting a ton of stuff. Um, if I lived in an area where it got really cold in winter and I decided I'm not gonna do any winter garden, I would just leave these tomatoes in here and get as many crops as I can out of them until the frost comes. The only reason I'm pulling these out right now is because I want to plant my cool season vegetables here. If I wasn't planting any, anything here, I'd leave them going, but I need to make room to plant. They're still growing, they're still putting on tomatoes, but I need to make room to plant, so I'm gonna get them out of there. Same thing with my peppers right here. These were all my sweet peppers. I've harvested all the rest of those sweet peppers. My spicy peppers were here. I took them all out. Um, had squash here, had beans here. All these beds are pretty much prepped. So that's basically the state of the garden right now. So now let's go back. I just want to give you all a general idea of what I do to transform my garden beds from being full of uh, the year's summer crops to prepping the soil and getting them ready to plant like this bed here and kind of showing you how I plant my fall crops. This bed was full of sweet peppers and I've harvested them all just as I've done with our tomatoes, our squash, everything else, but it might as well be any of them because I treat all of them the same right now as I prep my beds for fall planting. The last eight years or so, I've been practicing what's called no dig or no till gardening. So rather than remove the entire plant, pulling out all of the roots as I used to do. All I'm gonna do with these is cut them with my pruners right at the base of the plants and I'm leaving the roots in place. Probably the biggest question that I get with uh, people who aren't familiar with this technique as I'm removing my plants is, won't the roots like, uh, you know, regrow a new plant there or won't they get in the way of your planting? And in some cases, roots of some plants will re-sprout new growth, but when you're talking about removing your summer crops and I'm cutting these peppers right at the base, no, they're not gonna sprout out new plants. And all that's gonna happen with the roots that are left in the ground is over time, through winter, they're gonna break down, they're gonna decompose, they're you know loosening that soil, adding organic matter to the soil. Really, there's no issue at all with them. The reason I'm not just pulling the entire plant out is because it disrupts the soil. It's not in a huge way, you know, if you if you choose to remove your entire plant, maybe you have a disease or pest or fungus that's living in those roots, that's totally fine. But if you can leave them in place, not only is it easier to just leave them there, but it's gonna be beneficial as well. Next, I'll do a little weeding, rake out any of the debris and smooth out the soil. Then I'll replace my irrigation and I'll spread a nice two to four inch layer of organic matter, which can be compost, or for me, I'm using this recipe 420, which has been my go-to soil amendment for a few years now. It's got a lot of compost, but it has other beneficial bacteria, mycorrhizal fungi, and a lot of other great nutrients. So this video is not sponsored by this product, but if you can find it at your local nursery, I highly recommend it. Otherwise, use compost or your favorite soil amendment. 
Okay, so that's it. Essentially, this is all I do with my beds to prep the soil between seasons. And it really doesn't matter whether I'm prepping for my winter garden, my summer garden, any garden. As soon as I am finished with a crop, I turn over the beds just like this. The only variable would be if I tested my soil and I found it was depleted in one of the nutrients. Maybe it didn't have enough nitrogen or something like that. Then this would be a good time to add in an organic nitrogen amendment like blood meal or something else. But in general, that's all I do. I'll add a bag of that soil, you know, something else, maybe just some homemade compost if I have enough good stuff on hand. And that's what I'll be doing with the rest of these crops. So these tomatillos, the tomatoes, all these squash, they're all coming out. I'm gonna turn over all of these beds the exact same way. But for now, let's go back over there. I'm gonna plant some stuff. I'll show you what I'm growing. And to show you that, we need to go into the garage because I start all of my seedlings under LED grow lights and I'll show you that system real quick. Okay, here we are in the garage and this is my DIY LED grow rack. This is where I start all of my vegetable seedlings for our summer garden and now for our fall and winter garden. Now you don't need something fancy like this to start seedlings. This time of year you can really start seedlings in the ground just by direct sow into your beds. You can start them in containers outdoor, especially if you have a little greenhouse or hoop house. But I really like using an indoor setup like this because it gives me more control over my environment. I can have longer sunlight durations, well, longer light durations because I can leave these on for longer than the sun is up so they'll germinate more quickly, grow faster, and I've got more climate control in here. Like I said, it's 93 degrees outside today, so it's still pretty hot for a lot of the more tender vegetables like the lettuce that I'm growing and especially when they're in that seedling stage. So being able to use a system like this just gives me a lot more control over it. So that's why I essentially made this. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on exactly how I made this because I have an entire video that shows every step of the process, all the materials I use. I have a full material list and I have a full video on that on my YouTube channel. I also have a second video showing a comparison between regular LED shop lights like this and LED grow lights like this because these were not marketed for growing vegetables. These are just marketed for lighting up your garage or something, but they're a 6,500 Kelvin, which is the color rating and that's the important thing. These are marketed for growing vegetables and you'll see in that video that the comparison on what you get from them is pretty similar. So I just use them interchangeably. So basically I've got four racks right here. Each of these can hold four 72 cell seedling trays and they're in these uh, leak proof containers. So I just water them in here. I've got heat mats underneath them to help with germination. Some seed varieties need that or benefit from that. Others don't need it at all. On the end, I've got some fans to help air circulation, which is important when it's hot like this, but it also creates stronger stockier stems. Right now, I just wanna go through a little bit of what I'm growing on this rack. This is not everything that I'm gonna be growing this fall and winter, but it is a lot of it. As you can see, most of it is leafy greens. So starting up top here, I've got lettuce. And this is actually all romaine lettuce. There are a bunch of different varieties of romaine lettuce on this. I'm trying to kind of do a trial and see which one I like best. Romaine tends to, for me in my experience, bolt a little bit when it's hot. If I get a you know late heat wave in fall, and if I plant this in spring and get an early heat wave, it will bolt. So I'm kind of looking for one that is not only heat tolerant, but of course delicious as well. And then next to it here, I've got some herbs. Most of these are good, generally cold hardy winter herbs. So these will do just fine in fall. Some of them will thrive all the way through winter like this sage. I also have some dill, which is more tender, but it'll be fine for a couple of months. Some thyme, a couple different varieties of thyme. Cilantro, which some people think is a summer herb, but if you plant it in summer where it's hot, it's gonna bolt quickly. This time of year, cilantro does great. Also scallions, Italian parsley, somehow uh, lettuce got in here, I don't know how. More scallions, and this is uh, shiso. So this is, I think it's a Japanese herb, I don't know exactly, but 
It's a really cool looking herb. It's, it has this nice maroon color on the bottom side of the leaves and then kind of a cool green, almost silvery color to the leaves. Delicious one. It probably won't tolerate the frost, but it'll tolerate cooler temperatures just fine. In my area, I'll get, I think, at least a couple months out of it. And then this next rack here, this is all brassicas. So a lot of kale. This is red Russian kale and white Russian kale, two of my favorite kale varieties. These uh, produce pretty large, tender leaves. They don't have a lot of bitterness, but these will do great straight through winter here in zone 9B. If they get a little bit of frost, it's really not a big deal. And then these are curly leaf kale varieties. This is a winter boar kale, which is like a large curly leaf kale. And then this is red boar kale. So it's the same except it's purple. These do really well in frost. And I've even seen pictures of people growing these with a little dusting of snow on top and they're just fine. In fact, not only do they survive the frost, but when they get their first cold snap, it will start to make them a little bit sweeter. I think the starches sort of change in that and produces sugars. I don't know the full science behind it, but these will get sweeter when it gets colder. Growing kale in the summertime, it can often be a lot more bitter. So like if you've ever bought kale in a grocery store in summer and it's been really bitter, then you buy it again in winter and it's not quite as bitter, a little more sweet, that's often why. Next, I've got broccoli. So these are another brassica. These will do great straight through winter here in my zone with no frost protection at all. A couple different types of broccoli, some broccolini and even some cauliflower. More kale here. Um, let's see, I've got one called Dazzling Blue and then another one called Black Magic. So these are kind of like more of a dino kale variety. They're not that uh, wrinkly, curly leaf. They're the uh, longer, darker green leaves, like an Italian style kale. Also really good in cold temperatures and a little bit more heat tolerant. And on the lower rack, more lettuce. So these are all Salanova lettuce varieties. So Salanova lettuce is a leaf lettuce variety. So it doesn't make like a head of lettuce. You harvest it by just chopping the top off and you get a bunch of baby leaves. And it's also a cut and come again type of lettuce, meaning I can harvest this, the entire top of it, and it will grow back a second crop and even a third crop and it'll keep coming back. A little bit smaller each time though. So I've got uh, four different varieties of Salanova in this tray here. This one, I've got kind of some sparse germination on this rack. This is called Tatsoi, and it's a small Asian green. It's kind of like a bok choy, but much smaller. I've got a couple different types of spinach here, some Bloomsdale spinach, and then some Vit. And I just experimented with a couple of different things here. It doesn't seem like they germinated very well though. This rack, I've got some more broccoli and more cauliflower. And then here, most of this is Swiss chard. So all different colors of Swiss chard. Um, a red one here, some green, some yellow, some white, a bunch of different Swiss chard. I think the hardest thing with Swiss chard is figuring out different ways to cook it, but it certainly is easy to grow. Um, the stalks and the stems are also really good pickled. So Swiss chard, and another cool thing about Swiss chard is it adds color to your winter garden. When a lot of the winter garden is just full of green, which of course is beautiful, um, you know that flush of red, yellow, bright pink in the garden is pretty cool to see. So even if you're just growing it as an edible ornamental, Swiss chard is a great one for a fall and winter garden. Okay, so right now that's pretty much all I have on this rack. You saw a lot of leafy greens is what I'm growing. But in addition to leafy greens, I grow a lot of root vegetables and bulbs this time of year. Bulbs mostly for me being garlic. I can also grow onions, but most of what I grow uh, as far as bulbs in the winter is garlic. My garlic bulbs I ordered about a month ago and they should be showing up this week. The companies usually ship them out in mid-October because that's the great time 
to plant it. Basically you plant each clove, each clove grows straight through winter and then in spring, each clove will turn into an entire bulb and I'll harvest that. So garlic's a great one. And then all the root vegetables, carrots, beets, all of those things I'm direct sowing in the ground as well as my fava beans and a few other things. So um, any root vegetable is best to direct sow in the ground. If I was to start carrots in these trays, they're a big tap root, right? So that carrot would sprout, it would grow. And by the time I was ready to transplant these, that root would have hit the bottom of this tray and it might split, it might circle around. It's just not gonna be good for growing carrots. So carrots and other root vegetables, direct sow those seeds right out into the ground. So this is where I keep all of my seeds. I don't store them here in my garage because it gets a little bit warm. I store them in a cool place in our house, but basically this is a photo storage container and each one of these little pockets I fill with a packet of seeds. So this one's for my lettuce, I've got one for kale, I've got one for carrots, radish, peas, beets, greens, Asian greens, baby greens, winter herbs, and uh, cardoons. So this is a cool way to store your seeds. It works really well. I have a link to this um, on my Amazon page. If you can't find them locally in a store, I got this at what's called the container store here in Sacramento. So that's basically it for this. As I said, I have a full video on this seed germinating rack on my page. It's a DIY setup that works really well and compared to stuff that you can buy you know, on some of the gardening websites that are designed for growing your vegetables, it works as well, if not better in my opinion. And it's much cheaper because it's DIY and it's not marketed for that. So I'm gonna grab one of these trays of kale. We'll go out to the garden and I'll show you how I plant our fall and winter garden. Let's go get this stuff planted. All right, here we are ready to plant. I've got my kale, I've got my starter fertilizer. This is called Sure Start from EB Stone Organics. It's what I use when I plant every single thing in my garden, whether it's our winter crops or summer crops, a fruit tree, anything I use this EB Stone Sure Start. This is not sponsored by them. I'm not sponsored by them, um, but it's a great product. So if you have this in your area, I highly recommend it. Otherwise, I recommend just using any starter fertilizer when you're planting your fall and winter garden and all of your vegetables. So, Evie Stone Sure Start. I use a tape measure because it's not necessary to measure every single one of your seedlings where they go, but I like to get the most out of all of my spaces. So I wanna pack them in there as close as I can, but not to have them so close that they're, you know, overcrowding each other. So I like to generally measure it out when I plant. Um, I'm also using a pencil and a board because I'm just gonna graph down my measurements on this as a scale. And then a uh, miniature pitchfork, also known as a fork. And I'll show you how I use this. So let's get to planting. Um, a lot of things are spaced differently, right? Tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, the summer uh, crops, your winter crops, whether it's kale, lettuce, carrots, the spacing is going to be different. And I'm not here to tell you what the spacing is for everything or even what the spacing is for this kale, because depending on the variety of kale that you're growing, there's going to be possibly a different spacing for it. This uh, larger variety of kale can be spaced anywhere from eight inches, which is really close together to like 18 inches apart. Um, this particular variety, uh, I looked at the seed pack as I normally do for my spacing recommendations, and that's what I recommend. Uh, this red Russian kale is recommended to be spaced anywhere from 12 to 18 inches apart. I'm actually pushing it a little bit closer to maximize my space, and I'm gonna be planting it 10 inches apart. Um, will it be a little bit overcrowded? Possibly, but I'm gonna be able to get a lot more in here. If I did it 12 to 18 inches, I would only be able to get three wide in this row, but I really want to do four wide in this row. So that's why I'm going with 10 inches. So always look at either the back of your seed pack for your spacing, or if you're buying a um, seedling at a nursery or a six pack of seedlings, the tag on those seedlings should recommend the spacing. And as I'm doing with this, that's a recommendation, not a requirement. So if you want to go wider, go wider. If you want to go more narrow, go more narrow. Again, I'm going with about 10 inches spacing on all of this kale. So what I did is I measured out this board and I marked down every 10 inches on it. 
and I'll start by just placing all of my holes so then I can go back and put in my fertilizer and then plant everything. So I'll start with putting all my holes in the ground and you can use a shovel. These are really shallow rooted plants right now. So I'm just kind of digging them out with my hand. Start here on the front, just make real small hole there. Same distance back. Now you might notice that I'm not at all basing my measurement or my planting spaces on my irrigation system here. And the reason is that I don't have specific irrigation systems for each crop that I'm putting in. For instance, in summer, this bed was full of beans, but it wouldn't matter if it had been full of beans or squash or tomatoes or peppers or anything else. Even though the plants are spaced further apart, doesn't matter where the plants are because my irrigation is set up to irrigate this entire bed because eventually when these plants mature, their roots should be filling the entire bed. So it's set up to saturate everything rather than just give water to each individual plant. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about this irrigation system in this video because I do have, of course, an entire video on this irrigation system. It talks about how I set it up why I set it up and shows my entire install. So if you're interested in learning about my irrigation system, I'll add a link to that here. Okay, now with all the holes in place, I'm just gonna spread my starter fertilizer in each hole. And I'll just sprinkle a little bit of this in each hole. It's important to follow the directions on whatever fertilizer you're using, especially if you're using a chemical fertilizer because it's really easy to injure your plants if you use too much. Though, of course, I always recommend using organic fertilizers if you can. Um, with this organic fertilizer, it asks for about a teaspoon per plant when I'm planting these. So I'm just kind of generally doing that amount. If I give a little bit too much, it's not going to hurt the plants though, because this is an organic fertilizer. Now I'll remove all of the kale plants from this tray and I'll place them in their spots. And that's where this miniature pitchfork comes into play. If I've got a six pack, it's pretty easy for me to just turn it upside down and crush them out of there. But what I don't wanna do is pull on the stem because I risk actually tearing the plant off of its roots. So a fork works really well to get these tender little seedlings out of here. Just bring it into the side and pull it out just like that. When I seeded this tray, I overseeded it as I do with pretty much everything, which means rather than putting one seed per cell to make one plant per cell, I put two to three seeds in each cell. And one reason is because I know there's not 100% germination rate on these, although it looks like it's pretty close to it. I think I've got about 99% of these have germinated. But the other reason is because I know that when it comes time to transplant these, as I'm doing today, I can grow two in them as long as I separate them when I plant them. So that's the key, separation. So as you can see here, I've got two plants in this one cell. Now, if I plant these together, they're not just gonna die, but they're not gonna thrive because they're overcrowded. So all I have to do is go down to the base of these and gently pull them apart. Yes, some of the roots will break, but these are tough little seedlings. These will be totally fine. So now I've got two plants. I want to plant these separately, okay? So put one there. Almost every single one of these seedlings that I started, I overseeded with two seeds and they pretty much all germinated, which is great. So I'm just separating all these out and I'll place them in their own little spot. Okay, all the seedlings are in place. So now all I need to do is bury them and then I'll water them in. Um, with most seedlings, you really just wanna bury them to the level that they were growing at. You don't wanna bury them too far up the stem. With tomatoes and some other things that will put out new roots from their stem, you can bury them deeply. But with this kale, I'll probably only bury it about a half inch up the stem from where it was growing at in its container. far as these roots, if you had really root bound seedlings, 
you could break up a root ball with these because they're not root bound and because most of them were growing with another partner in there and I tore them apart that sort of broke up the roots enough but that said if you have encircling roots or something like that it's definitely a good idea at this point to break them up so that the roots go out rather than continuing to circle around okay all the plants are in the ground now the last step is just to water them in All right, one bed down and 11 more to go. I'm not gonna make you watch me plant every single one of these beds because the process of prepping the soil and planting for me is essentially the same with the exception of spacing differences depending on the type of plant. And some of these beds I'll be direct sowing crops like carrots and beets and garlic. But for the most part, it's the same. I will be, though, sharing some upcoming videos showing what I'm planting in each of these beds, including full garden tours for fall and winter. So if you want to see those videos, be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. And if you have any questions about planting fall gardens, planting winter gardens, or if there's anything that you want to see in those upcoming videos, leave a comment below. Happy gardening, everyone.